and hopefully everyone can see the slides. If someone could give me a, an indication of that, that'd be good. Yeah, can see the slides, David. Thank you, Dave. Uh, if everyone, uh, just another reminder for those just joining, if everyone can turn their uh, microphones and cameras off, we will be recording this session. So, um, Katrina, could you please start the recording? Um, We've just done that. OK, thank you. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, this is the sixth session of the uh, SWIC week, uh, the last but one, We've got the wrap up to come. Um, my name is David Jukes, um, and the session we've got today is on um, carbon capture, utilisation and storage and its role in the South Wales Industrial Cluster. As I say, I'm the chair. I'm also the uh, work for Costain. I am the lead. lead. Sorry, that's my Dr. Martin who thinks it's a good idea to join in. Um, my, uh, I am the lead of the SWIC deployment project. This afternoon's presenters uh, looking at the CCS solution is John Aldersley Williams from Progressive Energy. And then we've got three CC, CCU examples. Uh, one is a video from Dr. Paula Carey, one from uh, a presentation from Jim Woodger from Lanzatech, and the other from Chris Johnston from uh, from Mediate. And then hopefully we're going to have 10 minutes at the end. So I will give you a brief introduction to uh, the deployment project. Uh, the most striking figures, I think, is the fact that um, we, the project is worth £37.6 million, that's a £20 million grant and a huge £17.6 million of industry match funding. Uh, the other interesting figure for me is the figure at the bottom, which is if all of the SWIP projects that we currently considered in the application are fully implemented, it will require an investment of over £3.5 billion in South Wales. So, example of the projects we're looking at, um, there's uh, some CapEx uh, support for some energy efficiency schemes and then a whole raft of engineering studies. Uh, the ones the most interest to today's proceeding is the carbon capture, utilisation and storage technologies along the South Wales coast, CO2 transport and shipping and imported LNG to blue hydrogen with uh, CO2 uh, capture. And it's been noted, uh, you can see that down the bottom, uh, uh, with the verified uh, figures from the UK uh, ETS, uh, that in South Wales, the, nine, the, the 25 major emitters in South Wales produce a total of 13.317 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent every year. The majority of these uh, emitters are part of the SWIC cluster plan or deployment projects. So with the session on CCUS, I thought that what I should do is not is is I slightly changed my slides so that um, I the Welsh government produced a, sorry published their report uh, on a carbon capture and utilisation storage network for Wales on Tuesday, and there's a series of recommendations from the report. So I thought we would quickly go through those because I think they're probably relevant for today. Recommendation one is around CO2, uh, the export of CO2 by, by ship, and it encourages Welsh Government to engage with Bayes around the uh, business model framework. Recommendation two relates to the CCUS cluster sequencing programme, run, uh, which is currently in track one, uh, and South Wales, because it doesn't have offshore sequestration, is not considered part of track one, but it is felt in the report the Welsh Government should raise the issue with Bayes uh, to establish how South Wales can be represented in track two. For those of you who are not aware of uh, this, this uh, sequencing programme, that won't make a lot of sense. But uh, uh, if you have any questions, uh, please raise them in the chat bar along with any others, and we will uh, endeavour to answer them at the end. It is quite complex. So recommendation three is all around the packaging of solutions and the fact that there are a series of solutions of which CCUS is one of them. And it's encouraging Welsh Government to consider in its action plan that there is this flexibility to develop this range of solutions. 
Recommendation four is that a low whale Welsh government would not take responsibility for this for uh, the role of uh, for the storage, which will be the role of the, the transport and shipping company. It is recommended that Welsh government engages uh, in the uh, with the planned stores around the country to ensure that our agreements are in place uh, so that potential uh, CO2 export have something to go to. Uh, recommendation five is around the uh, Welsh Government forming a working group, CCUS working group, specifically for South Wales, um, uh, so that it can begin the necessary, plan uh, necessary planning work, uh, making sure that we can we can identify and and secure capacity at the ports uh, for CO2 shipping. Recommendation six actually applies to North Wales only. Recommendation seven, Welsh Government should be uh, begin a proactive programme of work to develop the national necessary skills and supply chain base in Wales. I think this is really, really important. Uh, we really want to make sure that South Wales and the rest of Wales uh, takes advantage of, of the opportunities that are coming. And the way to do that is to de develop and build the skills and supply chain base in Wales for Wales. Uh, recommendation eight, is the development of local pipeline infrastructure. Uh, John will touch on this as he print on his presentation uh, for for getting the uh, CO2 that is captured to the distribution points at ports. And the final recommendation is all around public perception uh, and it is encouraging Welsh Government to begin a proactive programme of communication to build support for the development of CCUS really really important that we engage with the wider citizen and it's not just left up to academics and engineers to look at solutions that are, that are involved in CCUS. Right that's the end of my uh, presentation. Uh, again leave questions to the end if you would, wouldn't mind. I'm now going to introduce uh, my colleague uh, uh, Dr John Olsey Williams from Progressive Energy, who's going to talk to us about uh, carbon capture and storage. Thank you, John. OK, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, can we just go to the first slide, please? Um, uh, so, yes, I've been given 10 minutes to talk about carbon capture and storage, so I may have to talk quite fast, I'm afraid. Um, but I've got to uh, introduce Progressive Energy first. So if I can go to the next slide, please, quickly. Uh, Progressive Energy is a project developer whose primary purpose in life is to help take material amounts of CO2 out of the UK energy system. And to do that, we are the lead project developer in, in HiNet, uh, which is a, an industrial decarbonisation project up in, in the Liverpool Manchester area, which is summarised by the kind of infographic on the left here. Uh, and we've also got other roles in, in decarbonisation projects. Uh, elsewhere around the country, looking at Morecambe uh, up in the, the East Irish Sea, looking at Bacton in East Anglia and in other places too. So uh, next slide, please. So I've been asked to talk about what is what is carbon capture and storage, and 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 at its at its at its root, it is simply what it says in the name. It's it's capturing carbon generally from industrial processes and finding permanent storage for it where it isn't contributing to the atmospheric volume of CO2 uh, and thereby contributing to climate change. And that CO2 can be captured from industrial processes. Uh, sometimes though that CO2 arises as a, as a function of the process chemistry, uh, simply a matter of, for example, if you are, are making cement, you have to take calcium carbonate and heat it to drive off the carbon dioxide. So that carbon dioxide needs to be captured and stored, but also uh, very substantially from uh, just burning stuff. Uh, you get carbon dioxide uh, in your flue gases which you need to extract. Uh, and and the, the processes that do that are typically involving uh, effectively using uh, chemicals called amines to strip the CO2 out of your gas stream, uh, concentrate it so you can then compress it, sometimes liquefy it, and then inject it into subsurface geological structures. And one of the lucky things we have around the coast of the UK as a function of the geology that's given us all the North Sea oil and gas uh, is a large number of depleted gas fields that are effectively empty tanks into which we can now put CO2 for storage. And equally, we've got geological structures that turned out not to have any hydrocarbons in them, uh, but are still full of formation water. Uh, in some cases, you can use those as CO2 storage tanks as well, and those are called aquifers. 
And CO2 storage is going to be a critical part of the whole net zero picture. There are some industrial sectors that you can't take the carbon dioxide out of through any other means. So next slide, please. Um, there are projects going on with carbon capture and storage even as we speak. Um, ironically, the first major use of in, in, in injected carbon dioxide into oil fields was actually to help squeeze more oil out of those oil fields in a process called enhanced oil recovery. And that's been going on for many years, particularly in the United States. Uh, clearly, that's not what we're trying to do with the carbon now, because uh, producing more oil isn't, isn't considered helpful. Um, we're looking at carbon capture and storage as permanent storage. Uh, and the, the most uh, uh, publicly known project at the moment in that say that space is the Northern Lights project in Norway, which is the kind of info infographic picture of down below. Uh, that's a project that is now moving ahead with sub substantial sums of money committed to it. That is doing the full chain of industrial capture to pressurizing and liquefying to put on boats, um, uh, sorry, and to put into pipelines to, to store offshore in, in retired oil and gas structures. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so for the UK, the first question and the particular question of interest to this, this conversation is, where is the storage potential? Uh, and this is a map that I borrowed from a report that was published a few years ago on CO2 storage potential around the coast of the UK. Uh, and surprise, surprise, the size of the blob relates to the size of the storage potential. And what you can see from a South Wales perspective is there isn't much anywhere nearby. The, the closest uh, storage sites are those in the Irish Sea. Uh, you can see labelled Hamilton Field, which is operated by uh, an oil company called ENI, uh, and the Morecambe North and South Fields that are operated by another oil company called Spirit. Uh, both lie closest to South Wales as, as geological storage, and all three, all, all of those structures are depleted gas fields. Uh, as you look to the east of the UK, you can see a uh, considerably greater variety of size and type of, of storage. Um, you've got both aquifers and depleted gas fields available to you uh, on the east coast, ranging from the north of East Anglia, where these structures typically contain gas, uh, if they are gas fields that are depleted, or are aquifers. Uh, and you can see endurance, which is the big yellow one, that's that's an aquifer structure. Um, the Hewitt field, for example, is, is, a, is a depleted gas field. And as you go further north, uh, into the, the central and northern North Sea, uh, you're looking typically at depleted oil or oil and gas fields. What is critical for South Wales in relation to this assessment is there is no known site in the Bristol Channel or west of Wales uh, until you kind of get around the coast to the Irish Sea. So the Irish Sea represents the closest geostorage potential for CO2 available to South Wales. Uh, so next slide, please. There are a number of industrial decarbonisation clusters around the coast of the UK that are pursuing projects under what's called the Industrial Decarbonisation Challenge, which is a funded programme, a government supported programme uh, pursuing uh, these projects. Obviously, SWIC is, is one of these and, and the deployment aspects of SWIC uh, represents a, a cluster of projects that are pursuing this idea for South Wales. The, the other significant clusters around the UK uh, there are uh, kind of five. Um, Acorn up in Scotland, which is relying on CO2 storage in, in central and northern North Sea structures, both aquifers and retired fields, uh, and CO2 capture both locally at the St Fergus gas terminal and kind of imported captured CO2 from the Grangemouth, um, Grangemouth terminal and, and petrochemical type facilities. Going further south, uh, the, next, the next cluster round, so going around the coast clockwise, we have the East Coast cluster, which comprises industrial capture, again, from both blue hydrogen manufacture and industrial capture of CO2 on both Teesside and Humberside uh, and, and their catchment areas uh, and exporting the CO2 to the endurance structure uh, in, in, the northern, oh, sorry, in the southern North Sea that we saw in the earlier slide. Further south on, on the east coast, you have VNet Zero, which is a smaller cluster centered on Humberside. Uh, which is anticipating capturing its CO2 and putting it in retired gas fields of the Southern North Sea. The Delphinus cluster, so another East Coast cluster, also centred on, on kind of Humberside, uh, anticipates again making uh, blue hydrogen, importing some CO2 
uh, and storing that again in, in geological structures. And then alone on the on the west side of the UK, the high net cluster centered on Merseyside, uh, which is uh, anticipating capturing CO2 from both industrial capture and blue hydrogen production and storing it in, in the retired gas fields that are operated by ENI, the Liverpool Bay fields of Hamilton, Hamilton North and Douglas. What you also see on here is some other sites where there may be potential for CO2 aggregation and export. Uh, Medway or, or somewhere in the Thames Gateway, Southampton, primarily the, the Fawley refinery, which operated by ExxonMobil, uh, is a substantial emitter of CO2. And in South Wales, we've got a number of very substantial emitters of CO2. Uh, from west to east, we have uh, the, the Milford Haven area where production of blue hydrogen can potentially uh, create quite a lot of CO2. Uh, there's a Valero oil refinery with CO2 emissions. There's a large CCGT power station in Pembroke. And then coming further east in Wales, we have the Tutter Steelworks at Port Albert. And then there are some other uh, smaller but still large enough to be interesting CO2 capture sites in, uh, in, in the Barry area in Cardiff and Newport. So for those sites, shipping is going to be absolutely critical. So if we can go to the next slide. Thanks. So the role of shipping, uh, this is this is the, uh, sorry, this is a slightly uh, poorly defined graph. So, so the, the smaller one of the country, um, of the UK as a whole, there shows the industrial emissions of CO2 by broad geography. And you can see that South Wales um, has, has a significant contribution to, to industrial CO2 emissions across the UK. It needs to find a CO2, a carbon capture and storage solution. And in the schematic, the, the SWIC, uh, the, our first phase of work under the Industrial Decarbonisation Programme, we produced this, this kind of infographic of South Wales. And you can see there is a number of tankers and CO2 terminals anticipated on that because shipping is, is really the only realistic way of getting these volumes of CO2 to a storage site. And there is no known local subsurface storage that's available. Uh, CCS is, is a decarbonisation. It's, it's one of a family of options. Uh, you can, if you have a plant that's producing carbon dioxide, you can capture the CO2 as it's emitted. Or you can change your process so you don't emit CO2 uh, because you change, you potentially change the fuel to a carbon free fuel like hydrogen or you electrify the process to use electricity for process heat instead of, of other fuels. CCS is likely to be the preferred way of decarbonizing the largest sites, but it is likely to be expensive for smaller ones. Uh, and that goes to the point that Dave Jukes is making a little bit earlier on about pipelines. Uh, we feel it's quite likely that there will be a number of CO2 export terminals, Cardiff, Newport, Barry, possibly, Port Talbot and Milford, serving local anchor CO2 emitting projects for which CCS is, is economically preferred. Uh, and only in, we think, quite limited cases will it be the cheapest alternative to, to connect other sites with CO2 capture to those terminals because the cost of capture on smaller sites is expensive and pipelines are also expensive and, and in some cases quite difficult to to pipe uh, to permit. So, so the shipping picture we think is going to actually be reasonably simple with a number of terminals shipping their CO2. And then the question is, where might that CO2 go to? Uh, and, the, and the obvious sites, the, the, the tempting thing, of course, is go to the nearest one, which would be the Irish Sea area. Uh, but uh, other clusters around the coast of the UK and indeed beyond the UK are also expressing a desire to build their business around imported shipped CO2. So the Acorn cluster in Scotland, Delphinus on Humberside, uh, and the Norwegian Norway, Nor uh, Northern Lights project are all uh, keen to service the market for accepting shipped CO2 to put it into their stores. So that's a kind of very high level whistle stop tour of CCS, what it is and why we need it. Uh, so I think the key takeaways are, uh, CCS carbon capture at large scale from some industrial sites is likely to be the cheapest way of achieving carbon reductions. Um, it can contribute to what we call negative emissions through providing carbon storage from biomass burning uh, and indeed from direct air capture if that becomes economic. Uh, and there are a number of destinations available for CO2 
to be stored. But it, what's critical is that a, a business model that supports shipping of CO2 evolves. And I think I'll leave it there and I'm very happy to take your questions at the end. Thank you, John. Um, the Welsh Government's report was published on, Thursday, on um, Tuesday, unfortunately doesn't take into account a lot of the use of carbon. That's uh, So one of the things we're trying to do today is redress that in our next sessions. So the next uh, uh, in production, uh, presentation is actually a video uh, from Dr. Paula Carey, who sends us his sincere apologies. She's not able to attend the session in person. Uh, Dr. Paula Carey is the co-founder and technical director of Carbonate Systems. She's renowned for her work in geology, mineralization and car carbonation. And before leaving acad academia, worked at the University of uh, Greenwich for over 20 years. Uh, I'm now going to ask uh, that we show the video if that's possible. If that's possible. Good afternoon. My name is Paula Carey, and I'm the founder, one of the co-founders, and the technical director of Carbonate Systems. I would like to thank you for the invitation to speak today in this carbon capture, utilisation, and storage session. Carbon capture, utilisation and storage, as many of, many of you know, is a blanket term that covers various techniques and technologies that would capturing the, the carbon dioxide that would normally have been emitted to the atmosphere. I'd like to separate the two and talk about CCS as carbon capture and storage specifically related to solutions that store the collected CO2 underground, whereas CCU and CCUS are the circular solution where the carbon dioxide is captured but utilised and stored sometimes not for very long in the case of manufacturer fuels but in the case of mineralization and carbonation which I want to talk about later stored permanently in the same way as storage underground. CCUS is a circular solution which does receive much less attention than CCS and quite commonly one feels that the U is put there just because it's convenient rather than actually concentrating on the utilisation. Both are necessary to meet the industrial challenges because on the whole utilisation will not be able to deal with the vast amounts of carbon dioxide that are generated from point sources. So that CCS will be needed to solve that overall problem. But CCUS, the U, can be used to, or the carbon dioxide has been used to manufacture products for, for many years, you know, everything from fire extinguishers to um, fillers for, for sandwiches as we all know, with the shortage of CO2 that we've got at the moment. But we're talking about particularly capturing the CO2 from a point source and using it in to manufacture a range of products that are replacing fuels or plastics or, um, in our case, um, aggregate products. These are sustainable, low carbon alternatives which have significant economic benefits because you can sell the valuable products. You are therefore, effectively, it's possible to subsidise the more expensive CCS. When we're talking about carbonation and mineralisation that is done by carbonate systems, we're talking about a permanent and safe storage of the CO2. So Carbonate Systems has developed a process known as accelerated carbonation over the last few years from laboratory to full commercial scale. We formed the company in 2006 and built under license um, three commercial sites within the UK developed from 2012 through to the current operation. These sites 
are treating um, the fly ashes or air pollution control residues from energy from waste plants using CO2 that is captured from usually fertilizer factories and transported in a tanker to the site. More recently, Carbonate Systems itself has developed a system where we can capture the CO2 from a point source directly and treat the industrial waste that is also produced on that site. So currently we have one plant established in France in collaboration with the VCAT cement group. And this is illustrated on in the picture on the right hand side of the slide here. So it's effectively a modular mobile system consisting of two 40 foot sh shipping containers and it can plug in directly to the flue stack of, in this case, a cement works, extracting a small amount of the flue gas and removing some of the CO2 before the remaining flue gas is emitted back to the flue stack. The containerized system can treat up to 12,000 tonnes of residue a year. And in the case of cement, this is the residue generated during the manufacture of cement as a result of trans the transfer to refuse derived fuel. But we've been working in all the different hard to abate industries that are listed here. You've got cement, energy from waste, biomass, the paper industry and the steel industry. So the technology is based on the fact that these types of or the residues from these industries will naturally react with CO2. If you leave it to a natural reaction, it can take many years. But if you control that reaction by slightly enhancing the concentration of CO2 or by getting the, the temperature and moisture conditions right, as we do in our technology, you can react the calcium and magnesium salts within those residues to form calcium carbonate. You can see the reaction in its simplest form in the middle here, calcium oxide plus CO2 to give calcium carbonate. In these controlled conditions, the reaction can take as little as 15 minutes. And in the process, some of the problems with these residues are solved by reducing the pH and in doing so, reducing the mobilization of heavy metals and other contaminants within the waste. The formation of the calcium carbonate means that the CO2 is permanently captured. It's also a, an exothermic or carbon negative process, so we can capture more CO2 in our materials than is used in the process to make them which distinguishes it again from some of the other utilization technologies where a lot of energy has to put, been put into the carbon dioxide to transform it into the, the long molecules that are involved in fuels or plastics. By managing the engineering of this reaction and the wastes, we can produce a variety of end products, but at the moment we've been concentrating on producing a lightweight aggregate that can be used in concrete blocks or ready mixed concrete or indeed in green roofing. Some of the waste streams have a chemistry that means that they could actually be used as a fertilizer as well. But of course, in that condition, you're actually trying to encourage the breakdown of the calcium carbonate in the soil. The benefits of using our technology is that it's a circular economic solution to the industrial wastes. So the benefit to the, the client, those people, the owners of the, of the residues, is that they're avoiding the cost of landfill or the management of the byproducts and residues from the industry. We can then get value from the safe and permanent capture of the CO2 and we're manufacturing products that can be sold. The aggregates themselves, as illustrated on the right here, are nice rounded pellets because of the, the way they're formed. But they, as I said before, they contain more carbon dioxide captured in them as the calcium carbonate 
than is used to manufacture them so they can be declared as actually carbon negative. As much as 150 kilos per ton of CO2 captured within them. Again, because of the way they're made, the pellets are lightweight, so you can save on transport costs of the aggregate compared with them, its natural alternatives. And some of the materials that we produce have what's called high grit properties. So if you put them in a concrete block, they can ameliorate the humidity within the room or balance the humidity. And because they're lightweight, they're fairly porous. So alongside the other secondary aggregates that um, such as um, expanded clay, they have insulating properties. Again, because of the way we make it, we can adapt the particularly the grading or density of the aggregate to fit, to fit the client's requirements. As I said, there are very many different applications of this aggregate. Our principal application is in, is in concrete blocks, mainly because we have to um, produce this material all through the year as the residues are. So a concrete block manufacturer will be using the aggregate also at a similar rate throughout the year. But it can also go into ready mix concrete, can be used as road subbase, and particularly a niche application might be in, in pipe bedding or as a green roofing substrate for some of the materials. In terms of its application to the South Wales Industrial Cluster, one of the problems in the cluster is that there is no ready um, geological storage. So there's going to be the requirement for a large amount of infrastructure to collect the carbon dioxide and then have to ship it to the nearest geological storage. Whereas if we have CCU or CCUS, we don't have those limitations. As I can demonstrate, the um, utilisation plans could be actually installed on site. And so the CO2 does not have to be transported. Obviously, there are the economic benefits. And as I said, that economic benefit particularly makes it complementary to the CCS. More importantly, I suppose, many of our utilisation technologies are commercial and are re real and ready solutions. And we don't have to wait until the complex infrastructure is in place for geological storage. In terms of the industries within the SWIC area, we've got the biomass plant, RWE, we've got Tata Steel's plant and the Cardiff EFW producing residues that are reactive to in our process. There are also historical deposits within the region that could also produce an opportunity for carbonate systems. So having put the U back in the CCS, I'd like to thank you for your patience with my presentation. Uh, unfortunately, Paula won't be able to attend the Q&A session. Uh, we put if anyone needs uh, to ask any further questions we have put a specific email uh, address in in the chat i'd now like to introduce a colleague called jim woodger from lanzatech who's going to give you the next uh, session a uh, next presentation jim excellent many thanks david and hopefully my uh, screen is popping up for everyone uh, to see the slides as we speak. Can I just get a thumbs up from uh, you, David, on that? Yes. Excellent, thank you. <clears throat> so uh, great to be here, everyone. Uh, thanks for the uh, the time. Just checking here, 10 minutes, which I shall keep to. Um, I'll do a quick introduction of uh, Lanzatech as a company, for those of you who've not uh, met us, and showcase the uh, technology that we've developed, and then talk about the uh, deployment of that technology uh, within the SWIT programme, uh, specifically around an alcohol to jet uh, technology that we're doing in the Port Talbot region. So uh, briefly, by way of introduction of uh, Landatech, uh, we are an industrial uh, biotechnology company, uh, originally started in New Zealand, but now based in Chicago, uh, raised over half a billion dollars over the last uh, 15 years, uh, developing two key technologies in the CCUS uh, space, uh, focused on the production of ethanol for transportation fuels 
on ethanol for chemicals and carbon smart products, as we'll see, and also on converting that ethanol into renewable and sustainable uh, aviation fuel. As you can see, we've got a number of backers and strategics uh, behind us. And as I mentioned, around 250 employees uh, globally. Just to showcase, therefore, the platform uh, technology that we've developed, um, uh, what we have is two technologies. Uh, one is gas fermentation and the other is the alcohol to jet uh, process. So this uh, graphic here will outline that uh, for us. Here we have the, uh, the gas fermentation process, which can take any form of, in, of gases in the form of carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide and hydrogen uh, into this process in order to produce ethanol. So we can take industrial off gases, such as those, for example, from the Tata Steelworks in Port Talbot. Uh, we can take sources of CO2 uh, combined with green hydrogen, that CO2 either coming from industrial uh, sources or indeed from direct air capture. And we can also take municipal solid waste and agricultural waste uh, via gasification uh, into this fermentation process. Uh, within that process, we have a unique uh, biocatalyst uh, that converts those gases into ethanol. And as we know, that ethanol today can be used uh, in road transportation, as I mentioned. We can put it through our alcohol to jet process to make sustainable aviation fuel and renewable diesel. Or we can use that ethanol as a building block into other uh, chemicals and other consumer products. Examples of which that we've done today include plastics for L'Oreal, uh, fibres for Lululemon uh, uh, yoga uh, attire, household cleaning products, uh, and even today on the shelves in Switzerland, uh, surfactants uh, made from uh, steel mill off gases in China that have been through the, uh, the supply chain of ethanol uh, through to surfactants uh, for use as uh, laundry detergents. You see that. Uh, the beauty of this technology is sort of a hardware software approach in that today's biocatalyst does indeed make uh, ethanol, uh, but we can also switch out to alternative biocatalysts in the future that will be able to make acetone, IPA or MEG directly. So what we have here is a technology that can capture a wide variety uh, of uh, uh, sources of uh, uh, CO2, CO and hydrogen and have many options in terms of where we direct uh, those uh, that, that uh, ethanol from that production, uh, whether it be into transportation or into, into you know, carbon storage in consumer products. And the beauty of this, of course, is at the end of the life of those products, they can come back to the start of the process so that we ensure that we have a carbon cycle operating above ground rather than taking fossil fuels out of the ground and emitting them to the atmosphere. So hopefully that gives you an idea of the overall technologies that we've uh, developed. Uh, pleased to say that this is now uh, fully commercially scaled up. Uh, this uh, slide here shows you uh, the um, uh, first uh, gas fermentation plants uh, that we have operational. Uh, the first one since 2018 in China, uh, running off, uh, uh, off gases from a steel mill, uh, has produced now over 100,000 tonnes uh, of ethanol from that facility. A second identical plant has just started up uh, this year in China, running on ferro-alloy off gases again producing ethanol and to the right of this slide you see the first plant will be operational next year in Europe. Uh, this is a gas fermentation unit using steel mill off gases from the ArcelorMittal site in Ghent, Belgium. And we have a pipeline of uh, projects and opportunities that we're working on uh, throughout uh, the, the globe running on different feedstocks in different geographical regions, all again taking waste gases through uh, to ethanol. <coughs> And moving to the second part of the, the technology platform I've outlined, uh, this gives you an introduction to the alcohol to jet process. Uh, this, as you can see, takes ethanol as a feedstock. It's ex feedstock agnostic in the sense that it can take ethanol from our own gas fermentation technology, first generation ethanol if we so desired, but also any form of second generation or waste based ethanol, uh, such as that from cellulosics. Uh, the process is a, a four step process to produce uh, alcohol to jet synthetic paraffinic kerosene, uh, which is a approved, fully approved under the ASTM standards for use in uh, commercial aviation today in blends of up to 50% uh, with fossil jet fuel. Uh, as a byproduct, we also make renewable diesel, which again is approved uh, as a uh, development fuel under the RTFO, for example. We've scaled up this uh, technology and uh, been operating this uh, at a pilot plant since uh, 2014 and which we would use that pilot plant to make the fuels required 
for that certification program and also to do a number of demonstration flights that you see here in, in commercial flight. Uh, we have a facility of 10 million gallons a year uh, in construction right now in Georgia in the US uh, that will be starting up uh, you know, next year and a number of projects around the globe at 30 million gallons a year scale or 100, over 100 million uh, litre uh, per year scale, including of course one uh, based in, in Port Talbot in Wales under the SWIC programme. So this is a project that has actually been uh, underway since about 2018 uh, as part of a feasibility study with F4C funding, uh, but it now has crystallised around a, a full alcohol to chip project in Port Talbot. The inside battery limits elements you see in the, in the upper box there have been funded under the Green Fuels Green Skies program, and so we are doing front end engineering design for this facility uh, as we speak. And under the SWIC program, uh, the, the uh, site selection, permitting and, and uh, outside battery limits, utilities and storage elements have been funded uh, within SWIC. And so we're working with our partners such as Costain and Turley uh, on, on those, uh, those elements. The idea is that we'll be getting to a final investment decision on this project at the end of next year uh, with an anticipated startup of the facility in uh, 2025 uh, to meet uh, you know, potential government mandates for sustainable aviation fuel, but more importantly also to meet industry demand from the aviation sector uh, for, for this material. We also have the ability, as I mentioned, to link upstream our gas fermentation technology potentially using off gases from the Tata Steelworks uh, through that gas, gas fermentation process to produce the ethanol for the alcohol to jet uh, technology, or indeed that same gas fermentation technology to take waste gases from municipal solid waste or other sources of CO2 in the South Wales area, uh, all of which is under, under uh, a feasibility study right now. So yeah, very excited about the work that we're doing with SWIC and our partners, bringing everyone together around this uh, specific project and the interest that this has generated, uh, particularly for Port Talbot, and uh, look forward to discussing it further with you, and of course, uh, executing on this project and making it a reality in the coming years. So with that, I think I um, uh, look forward to answering your questions later, uh, but for now, it's my turn to hand over to uh, Chris Johnstone uh, from, from Remediate uh, for the next presentation. So over to you, Chris. Thank you, Jim. Um, hello, everybody. I hope you can all hear me and see the slides. If somebody can give me a thumbs up, that would be great. Hey, that's good stuff. Hi, um, I'm Chris Johnston, and um, we're just going to talk about um, uh, remediate and how we clean the planet and feed the world at the same time. Next slide, please. OK, you, um, you guys are probably aware of um, all this stuff, that there's um, lots and lots of CO2 around and uh, there's more and more pressure to get rid of it. Um, taxes are going up uh, and the, the way we're, we're looking at it, uh, the negative emission technologies, um, um, they're going to cost uh, to do it. So what um, our view is, um, is that um, if you can make it profitable, then uh, people will pay more attention uh, to doing something about it. Next slide, please. So as well as um, industry having lots of um, uh, CO2 um, uh, to uh, remediate, there are other sectors that are under pressure. The particular one is the feed industry and the food industry. We, we have to produce more food. Um, the, uh, the, the scary thing is that we, we don't exactly know how we're going to do that yet uh, because we have to produce a, a more food in the next four decades than uh, we've ever harvested since the year dot. Next slide, please. So we use algae. We take the um, uh, one man's um, rubbish and turn it into another man's um, um, gold. So for every couple of tons of CO2, uh, we can produce uh, uh, about one ton of, um, uh, of biomass. Algae is um, a fantastic um, thing. It actually built the planet um, years and years ago. 
and it contains lots of um, um, lipids, proteins, omega-3s, um, uh, antioxidants, as well as the protein. And we can make it do lots of things, depending on what strain of algae we grow and how we grow it. Um, so we're looking at um, you know, animal feed first off, but there's other things that we can, uh, we can do with it. Next slide, please. Nobody's been able to grow natural algae um, at the scale needed um, and with a consistent quantity and quality uh, for people to um, bother to develop the market. The traditional methods are open ponds and biofences, and they are um, inefficient and costly. We have made a, a breakthrough in how we um, grow algae and photobioreactors to um, big industrial quantities and to, uh, and to spec uh, consistently. So that when people want to develop a market, they know that you know, we can deliver on a regular basis um, the quality that they require in order uh, to put it through their uh, production systems and marketing system. The technology has been uh, deployed um, and proven um, at the cement works at a, a district energy plant. Um, the cement works, we've been um, playing with the technology uh, with um, raw flue gases uh, for about seven or eight years. So we've got lots of um, data there. And I mentioned the raw flue gas, so, and we do take it all. Um, there is very little pre-processing required other than to meet clean air uh, regulations. So as long as the big lumps are taking out where all the nasty stuff generally lives, then um, uh, we will take um, the raw flue gas. There's no need to extract the CO2. In fact, within the flue gas, there's some um, nutrients that the algae love, and um, we make use of those. Next slide, please. We scale. Um, we have built this using the Danish model. Um, so the, um, it's um, in, in, in modules. So we can go from small uh, to very large by just adding more modules. So the scaling is not um, uh, a, 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 a technology issue anymore. It's an engineering issue about how we connect um, the infrastructure together. Uh, which is not something that's uh, tremendously difficult to uh, to overcome. So I, I say we 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 bolt onto the end of the um, uh, of the stack and we just take the uh, the raw gases. We have a, a project running now with um, a power generator in uh, in South Wales, uh, Simec Atlantis. And we're scaling up now, the engineering is going on now to take 10,000 uh, tonnes an hour of raw flue gas um, and convert that into, uh, into biomass. Next slide, please. So we pull this, uh, it's, a, it's a systems integration um, effort um, with ourselves and uh, some uh, other partners. And there's another a uh, key element of this um, in South Wales. In South Wales, you have a world-class um, uh, company that turns electrons into photons. And when we're using photobioreactors, we need um, a lot of light inside the tank. And um, in South Wales, um, some of the uh, best in the world at, at uh, turning out um, those electrons into photons um, uh, live and work. Uh, and that's with our, uh, one of our partner companies and indeed sister company, um, um, uh, Neutralite. Next slide, please. So for um, an, an emitter, um, we can run um, uh, the algae installation in um, a number of ways. So we can do, uh, deliver the algae as a service, um, or we can um, train people and um, uh, allow them to uh, run it themselves. Uh, most people are looking for us to run it as a service. The 
um, project um, at CIMEC um, will be um, a joint venture um, with um, the finance company um, CIMEC, uh, ourselves and a, a couple of others uh, to put that together. We also uh, we, we plan to start that in, um, uh, in January. Um, at the same time, we have another project running um, in Norfolk at uh, combined heat and power uh, plant, which is used to provide the energy for um, sugar beet processing. The company in involved is called British Sugar, and they have a sister company called AB Agri, who is one of the world leaders in animal feed production. Now, this is key because to make it profitable, we need to sell the, the biomass. And um, AB Agri have committed to buying um, 1 million tonnes a year um, of the biomass. So Simec, um, Atlantis, and Usmouth will only provide about a third of that. So we have to do a bit more. So we have about four or five years to, uh, to get it up to speed. I'll be happy to take any questions uh, a little bit later on. Uh, back to you, David. Thank, thank you, Chris, uh, and I appreciate everyone for but, uh, trying to stick as much as possible to the time. Uh, I'd just like to thank uh, uh, John, uh, Paula in our absence, Jim and Chris for their time today. Um, we've got about 10 minutes uh, left for some questions, uh, including the, from my dog from the sound of it. Um, I have asked a colleague, uh, Dave Richardson, to compile uh, some of the questions for the panel. So. Uh, David, if you're there, and there any, you can see there's a lot of activity, and I'm glad I've asked you to try and herd those cats. Thank you. Yeah, um, good afternoon, everyone. So I've tried my best to capture the questions as we've gone through, um, and quite a number of them have already been, uh, been answered. So what I thought I'd do, um, first of all, is just give the the representative speakers, just if they've been watching the questions, just to a quick minute each um, and probably start in reverse order, Chris, because you are you can probably see a question on the on the screen for you. You're on mute, Chris. Uh, you're on mute, Chris, you need to unmute yourself. There you go. There you go. Yeah, life cycle analysis, it's um, uh, we've had uh, several done. Um, and um, what we generally uh, see is we compare ourselves to the um, uh, to the, uh, the protein that we're replacing in the animal feed chain. So the life cycle analysis analysis is done against um, uh, soy basically, and uh, we come out um, very favourably um, against soy. And we absolutely massacre any soy uh, soy that comes from um, uh, brownfield sites, so any forest um, uh, deforestation, uh, the carbon footprint of that uh, compared to what we uh, we do, is um, is, is a huge difference. So life cycle analysis. If anybody wants, I can provide the report on that. It's about thirty pages of detail. Um, we can have a look at it. Thanks, Chris. Thanks very much, uh, Jim. You, there was a couple of questions in there for Lanza Tech. Do you want to just make some comments? Sure, um, perhaps in sort of reverse order as I'm looking at them, uh, there's a question about uh, logistics of, of how we collect the CO2 uh, from, from the, the producer or the emitter. Uh, what we actually do is co-locate, I should have said, we co-locate our uh, factories at the source of CO2. So in the case of, for example, the, the Chinese facilities that I, I showed, they are actually located right at the output of, of where the CO2 is being emitted by the steel mill. So there is no transportation of CO2 or CO uh, to the technology. It literally, the, um, the off gases come out of the blast furnace and are piped directly into our, our, uh, our, our unit uh, so that we don't have those, uh, those logistics to deal with. Of course, if you're then going to the alcohol to jet process, your feedstock is ethanol, which again, you can either co-locate the facility um, or you can uh, transport ethanol as a liquid uh, far, far, far easier. Um, there was a question about the cost of the uh, the SAF, the sustainable aviation fuel, and that, that really depends on, on the feedstock cost. 
Um, and so whether it's waste gases or other sources of ethanol, what I would say is that the SAF that we produce from our technology can be cost competitive uh, with fossil jet fuel today uh, for certain feedstocks uh, that are available, uh, but also we must recognise the cost of SAF can also be you know, uh, two to three times higher than the cost of fossil jet fuel, depending on other perhaps more sustainable, less available, uh, less scaled uh, sources of, of ethanol today. So very project specific, uh, but um, something that we're uh, we're looking at closely in our, our projects and working uh, with industry bodies and, and the government to look at how we bridge that gap for this first of a kind technology. Um, there was also a question about why we particularly are lo located with steel mills uh, so far. Uh, the response there is that it just so happened that our first projects were, were located at steel mills and, and ferro alloy uh, mills. There's nothing particularly special about that as our technology can work on any source of CO2, uh, CO or, or hydrogen. Um, we have projects globally working on uh, gasified biomass, uh, working on gasified plastics, working on refinery uh, emissions, uh, working on um, uh, steel mills, of course. Uh, and in fact, projects looking at direct air capture of CO2 from the atmosphere, atmosphere through to our, our gas fermentation technology. I think those were the main ones that I saw. It is, Jim. Uh, thanks very much. I think I think one also uh, thing to to point out is logistically, um, South Wales is is well positioned for a couple of regional regional airports and and also um, well connected from from a fuel distribution point of view to the pipelines. Indeed, indeed. Thank you. So, so a good location. Um, John, just before I come to you, um, we'll talk about um, sequestration and storage, I'm sure. Um, there was a question that um, was asked about the um, timescale and scheduling for track two, talking about the um, the cluster sequencing. And uh, I think uh, you can find the, the data on the government website, but just to to say that um, they expect to um, announce track one clusters 25th of October, although it says from 25th of October. And uh, remembering that the, the announcement for this phase two of the deployment project took a little bit longer than uh, anticipated, like three or four months, um, then who knows when that might actually take place. But uh, But that's where you'll find the answer. Um, it's on it's on the government website. They haven't made a declaration of when track two will play, take place, apart from it will be scheduled after track one, which is pretty obvious. So, John, uh, we had a number of questions um, talking about the uh, the potential for for uh, geological storage in in Bristol Channel, in in uh, other elements or other areas of uh, uh, of South Wales offshore and onshore. I think do you just want to make uh, just a brief comment. Yeah, of course. Uh, actually, on on timing, somebody also made a point in the comments that the first two clusters in in track one are intended to be operational by 2025, uh, and the subsequent clusters 2030. So I would hope to see uh, significant volumes of CO2 being shipped out of South Wales well before 2030. Uh, and I think uh, you're right that the COP20, uh, sorry, the uh, the cluster sequencing announcement is scheduled the 25th of October from, but I think the backstop date of COP26 is, is a pretty firm one. So I, I would expect to see an announcement on the 25th or very soon after. Um, yeah, thanks for that, John. Just uh, just to, to say we, we have to finish Bob on four o'clock. So um, you've got about a minute. OK, in relation to geology, sadly, the, the, the geology of South Wales has really not been favourable. So uh, it's not a matter of just drilling a well somewhere and stuffing CO2 down and hoping it stays there. You need a the right geology, you need a, a porous formation, you need the right structure and you need integrity. And, and long years of exploration haven't found that in the Bristol Channel or off West Wales, uh, at least at any scale. Uh, and that's why uh, really there is no local geological storage option. Thanks, John. Uh, very much appreciate that. And I suppose I can add to that. There are there are companies out there who are considering um, these these options. But as John alluded to there, um, knowing a little bit about the geology from oil and gas exploration um, uh, enhances the um, the appetite to store and, and decreases the risk of storage. David, do you want to wrap up? Yeah, thanks all. Uh, just again, my thanks to John, Paula, Jim, Chris and David for uh, heard in those uh, questions. 
I also like to quickly thank uh, Katrina and her colleagues at University of South Wales for uh, helping us put this on. Uh, I hope that Chris is still listening and that he's happy that we have finished with about 30 seconds to go. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Have a good evening. Bye for now.